Bless us, Lord, as we preach the gospel today. In Jesus' name, amen. Allow me to begin by saying something today that I said yesterday in the message. I said that, and it actually belonged to this message, but I borrowed it. There are no mistakes, no accidents with God. No pages to be torn up. All, it all counts. When it comes to God and your existence, it is not by accident. When it comes to God and your existence, no one is here by mistake. And when it comes to God with your life, and the things that happen in your life, as the Lord writes the script for your life, there are no pages. People who write know, understand, when you're writing, sometimes you get it wrong. Take that paper, ball it up, throw it in the trash can, then you write another script. If you're trying to write the story, if you don't, ball it up, throw it away. Well, it, it, God doesn't throw paper away. The Lord knows what he's doing. You follow me? And, and, and I want to say that this is one of the reasons why we fight so hard against the, the merciless killing of the unborn. You interrupt things when you do that. It's, if, again, if anybody ha anyone has and you've, re you've repented, then, 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 then and, and the, the Lord has forgiven you. But, but only time will tell. Only time will tell. How we robbed our lives and what, what and who we robbed ourselves of by turning to this quick fix that cost a few hundred dollars, cost about 30000 to go through the process to a, adopt a child in many cases and 300 to abort one. What does that tell you? But you never know. You never know. You just never know. Could be mother who is alone now. Dealing with children who don't hardly come to see you. Could be that the one who would have been there for you didn't get a chance. I said yesterday, some people have aborted other people's spouse, spouses. Because life doesn't start. Someone called me the other day. God bless you, Mama. So good to see you. Someone called me the other day and said that I had a preacher to call, a bishop from, ah, he was from um, Mississippi. Was it Mississippi? Uh, Alabama somewhere. And uh, he left a message. He had saw our uh, video that we did for life. And he called me and I returned his call. And he said to me, he says, and it's always good to get a word of encouragement. Many times in these battles, you don't. He said, I just wanted to say to you, and I was braced for whatever debate. I knew what we had aired. Um, he said, I wanted to say, great job. Well said. Job well done. I could tell by talking to the gentleman that I was talking to a man who, who was quite scholarly. And this bishop added something to our argument that I gladly receive and I said to him Bishop thank you he said you know people say that life begins with conception he said but Reverend it 
Bishop, it really doesn't begin with conception. And I'm thinking, I know this man is not getting ready to go uh, Gosnell on me. And Gosnell didn't believe that life started until the child started breathing outside the womb. That was why he could so easily abort so many babies. He said this. He said, life begins with God. With God. And all of us, we didn't start at conception, we started in the mind of God. Hallelujah. And then he backed up his argument with scripture. He said that the Lord told Jeremiah, before you were in your mother's womb, before, before you were in your mother's womb, I knew thee. Before. 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 Isn't that something? Before you were there, I knew thee. Speaking of the, 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 the script and why we fight this, the Bible says in Psalms 139 and verse 16, Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members, that is, all my days were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. That is, before uh, I was born before I was fully framed, my days were numbered. My life was written out. Lord has plans for every one of us. Amen. I want to say this too about uh, all of this stuff about destiny and because you hear a lot about that and some people have made a whole ministry on preaching destiny. The only thing about the destiny preacher is that they won't tell you a key thing about destiny. Key thing about destiny is you don't reach your destiny. You don't live it. And you really don't know it until you die. Think about it. Because as long as you're living, Sister Marilyn, your, your story is being written. You have to be stretched out across before your destiny in terms of how you leave here, speaking here on this earth. You don't see that until you die. See, so the athlete says, the guy who's successful, I've reached my destiny. No, he hasn't. He's at this juncture in his life right now. But if he doesn't die there, tomorrow's coming. And the next day. Therefore, if you're in the lowest place in your life, and everything, Sister Harris, is going wrong, you hadn't reached your destiny. You're just at that place. Tomorrow's coming. And since tomorrow is coming, you got to think like tomorrow is coming. You got to believe like tomorrow is coming. You got to know how to tell yourself, God's not through with me. There are other chapters, paragraphs, pages even to be written. I didn't see her and I didn't get notification that she was here. But God bless missionary Sandra Smith. Good to see you this morning. Still praying for you. I didn't know you were here today. God bless you and God keep you. Every one of us have a script. Amen. That God writes. And 
And I believe that true fulfillment is in life is finding the script that the Lord has written for you. Some of us fight God. We fight God tooth and nail. Amen. Why fight the Lord? The Lord knows you better than you, you know yourself. Amen. His, his will, his desire, oh, it would fit you like a hand in glove. There's a reason why nothing else fits right. The relationships don't work out right. The job don't do right. You haven't found your script. Hallelujah. Some of us have had a raw deal out of life. Amen. But we need to recognize that God's providence means that even in life when things haven't gone the way we want them to do, to, he weaves the strands of the events together to make each of us the unique individual that we are and it's for his glory. Don't spend your time looking across the fence saying, I wish I'd have had, I would have had a mom and dad like she had or like he had. Or I wish I would have been born in the ideal conditions that you assume are ideal that someone else were born in. Or I wish things would have worked out for me if I just could have if I just could have been born on this side of town, or if I could have just come here another color, or if, if I could have just been a, another race or a different gender, I think my life would have been better. That is foolish thinking. And it is a waste of time because it doesn't allow for one to avail themselves to the all-knowing, uh, all-wise, almighty God of the Bible. He is ingenious. The Lord knows what he's doing. I think that's why our anthem song, they call it the anthem, I come from a poor fat Mississippi poor boy, that they did such a great job with. Mother, I wish you'd have been here to hear it. Amen. It's just, wow. We, we've had church. The, the, the male choir tore it up. But the, the, the genius of that song that God gave to the Canton spirituals is that it deals with humble beginnings. But you're not bitter because they were humble. You're not mad because they were humble. You accept that. I come from a poor family. Truth is, we didn't have much. But looking back, the law has been good to me. It acknowledges a life where at some point he was made fun of. We didn't have any money. And a lot of my friends thought that that was funny. But I'm here today. I can stand up and say Regardless of all of that, the Lord has been good to me. And he goes right back there again. We were raised in a shack. You know the lyrics. But the conclusion is, he's been good to me. And he goes from the material good to the spiritual good. I just got one question. Anybody got the Holy Ghost? I don't mean to be nosy, but does anybody have the Holy Ghost? Goes from the, the, the natural uh, to, and it, and it ends with this great crescendo and the drive, and everybody just pumping. He's been good to me. Been good to me. It ain't no I won't complain. He's been good to me. Been good to me. Been good to me. Good to me. That is, that's insight. Joseph insightfully said to his brothers, but as for you, 
You thought evil against me when you sold me into bondage. But God meant it for good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. This is Genesis 50 and 20. It's one of the most insightful uh, passages as this prime minister of Egypt looks back on his life while standing before his brothers who are before him now with hat in hand. Their dad had just died and been buried. The same brothers who sold him afraid now that with him having all the power, did I say all, all the power on his side, outranked only by the king of Egypt himself, Pharaoh, said to his brothers, no, you didn't have good intentions when you sold me. You, matter of fact, you had evil intentions. But looking back on it now, but God, meant it for good. One of the things I want you to concentrate on is the it. See, some of us spend our days playing over and over and over in our minds the hurtful, painful, disappointing it's that have happened in our lives. But sometimes you need to move to another level and say, well, the Lord allowed it. And, and since the Lord allowed it and I know the Lord loves me then why should I live the rest of my days bound by it why don't I instead learn from it and grow from it and make something out of my life because of it or despite it or regardless of it you ought to be bound and determined that you're not going to be bound by it. Fifty and still bound by something that happened to you when you were twelve. Why do you let it bind you? It's on you. But may I digress for a few minutes? Will you pray for me? This great spiritual insight that Joseph had. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Deacon. Amen. This wasn't something, however, that he was born with. Because somebody's going to walk away with the same insight today. But it's going to help you to know that Joseph didn't always feel this way. He didn't always feel that God meant it for good. Amen. When he was stripped of his coat of many colors, and when his brothers cast him into a pit that was empty and the pit had no water, Genesis 37 and 24, he, he didn't. He didn't think that God meant it, <laughs> meant that for good. The Bible says in 37 and 24, and they took him and cast him into a pit. And the pit was empty, empty. There was no water. And then in that empty pit thrown in there by his brothers, when he was sold to some Ishmaelites who was headed to Egypt, Soul into bondage, according to Genesis chapter 42 and verse 21. Joseph didn't think that that was good, that God meant it for good at the time that it was happening. For Genesis 42 and 21 says, And they said one to another, We are very guilty concerning our brother, in that we saw the anguish of his soul. 
When he besought us, when we would not hear, therefore is this, this distress come upon us. They said, when we sold him, he cried, saying to his own brothers, don't sell me. Now his crime was that he had a dream. That one day he would rule over his brothers. And he made the mistake of telling them. And they got jealous. And they said, oh, you're gonna, you're gonna, he was the baby. You're going you're gonna to rule over us. Well, we'll show you. They actually thought to kill him. And I think it was Reuben who prevailed and said, no, don't kill him. Thank you for that, Reuben. But don't kill him. But we're going to throw him in a pit. And they threw him in a pit and left him there until they saw some Ishmaelites, who were also called Midianites. A caravan of people. Strangers. Strangers. They were not Hebrews. Their customs were not his. He didn't know them. You're talking about people showing up with the board, at the border with children. You don't know whether they're theirs or not. They sold him. And how can you do that to your own brother? And he's saying... Guys, please, please, I'm your brother. And, 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 they, and, they, and they buy him, and, and they, they sold him uh, for 12 pieces of silver, according to verse 28. And that was the, the, the cost of a, uh, a teenage male. So he was sold into slavery. So you thought America invented slavery, didn't you? He was sold into slavery. By his brothers. This is why you shouldn't fall for someone saying, I'm for reparations. Look, some of the, how are you going to divide the money up? Some of the people who owned slaves back in slavery were black. Some of us in here today, unbeknownst to us, are descendants of former slave owners. The statute of limitations has run out on that promise. And since none of us are slaves, let that go. Well, I'm just going to wait on mine. I bet you Jesus will come first. It's not going to happen. Jesus is coming. Reparation, forget that. Damn, that's not going to happen. So he sold him. And, and he's hurting. He's crying. Wouldn't you? But he still didn't write himself out of the script. Then, according to Genesis 37 and 36, he was sold again. The Ishmaelites, the Bible says, and the Midianites sold him in Egypt. He's now in a strange land. Sold him in Egypt unto Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh's and captain of the guard. Sold, sold into Ishmaelite slavery. Now he's sold into Egyptian slavery. His dad, miles away. His brother's miles away. He's committed no crime. He's done no harm. He certainly didn't see at that time the good that was in it. Are you with me? But he still didn't write himself out of the script. According to Genesis chapter 39, Joseph quickly moves up. And things were wonderful for this young Hebrew in the house of Potiphar until Potiphar's wife oh my she got the eyes she got the hearts for the Hebrew praise the Lord and Potiphar had put Joseph over his entire house and Joseph was a trustworthy man see notice if you, if you study his life, you'll notice that in every situation, this is why you know he never wrote himself off out the script, in every situation, he prospered. 
Wherever he landed, he was fluid enough to adjust. Some of us need to learn how to adjust. You can't shift. You're too, you're too stiff. You're too set. No, oh, I'm, I'm just going to hurt. I'm, I'm just going to be in pain. I'm just, I'm just going to suffer in the shadows of what happened to me uh, all my life. And, and, and some of you people don't even want to talk to you because uh, I had one brother, he left the church. But all he wanted to do is meet with me and talk over and over and over and over and over about the bad things that happened to him when, when, when he was young. And, and around that second, halfway through the second meeting, and I saw that that's the way this is going to go, oh, that was it. Now, you need to go somewhere else because I can't help you. I'm, we, we're not going to relive that forever. There are, there are greater hills. Amen. There are other things. And, and everybody has a story. Don't, don't try to win the sad contest. Oh, my story is sadder than yours. Oh, you died when you was a child. I died three times. <laughs> so we're trying to, Tom was trying to outsad one another. Cut that stuff out. I got one for you. I killed three. I killed five. You know, come on. That stuff. That stuff gets old. And this guy, he moves up, and then Potiphar's wife gets the hots. And after several attempts, I mean, she said to him, "Lie with me." And uh, and 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 he turned her down. And when he turned her down, uh, for the last time, she got desperate. And you know what she did? Instead of leaving him alone, she turned on him. The Bible says in 39, Genesis and 12, some of y'all didn't know this was in the Bible. It says, and she called him by his garment, saying, lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out, got him out. Well, what was he doing there in the first place? Potiphar had put him over his entire house. She had told him in verse 7, lie with me. The Bible teaches in verse 6, and he left all that he had in Joseph's hand. And he knew not all he had, save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person and well-favored. He was handsome, and he had the favor of God on him, even though he was in slavery. And doing well, and verse 7 says, And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eye upon Joseph. Hmm. And she said, lie with me. Verse 8, but he refused. And said unto his master's wife, behold, my master wotted, that is, knoweth not what is with me in the house. And he have committed all that he hath to my hand. There is none greater in this house than I. Neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee. Because thou art his wife, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Now that's what he told. Verse 10 says, and it came to pass as he spake to, it came to pass as she spake to Joseph, look at this, day by day, lie with me, lie with me, lie with me, lie with me, get it, get it, get it, take it, take it, take it, please, 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 hit it. What? I say something. And it came to pass about this time that Joseph went out into the house, look at this, to do his business. And there was none of the men 
of the house there within. It was legitimate. That's the point I'm trying to make. She caught him and grabbed him and said, lie with me. And he wouldn't do it. And he ran out. And it came to pass that when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand. I mean, that was harassment. That's, that's, why was the Me Too movement then? Left his, his garment in, in her hand. You see that? And he was fled forth that she called unto the men of her house. Excuse me. Literally, she screamed. She began to holler. And spake to them saying, See, he hath brought in an Hebrew. He hath brought in, the way she used the word Hebrew, a That's the way the word Hebrew was used there. She didn't call his name. Now, all the other times, he wasn't called a Hebrew when she wanted him to, you know. He was a man, a honey, you know, whatever. Uh, but, but when he wouldn't, he's a Hebrew. <laughs> I started to tell you to tell your neighbor, hello, Hebrew. But I'm not going to do that, see? <laughs> so, praise the Lord. Says, and, and really, what she would say was disrespectful to her husband as well. She called to the men of her house and spake to them, saying, See, he had brought in uh, uh, an Hebrew to mock unto us, to mock us. She's indicting Potiphar. He came in unto me, talking about uh, Joseph, to lie with me, and I cried with a loud voice. Woo, liar. And it came to pass when he heard that I lifted up my voice and I cried, that he left his garment with me and fled. He got out and, and got, got him out. And, and, she, and she took his garment and, and laid it there and waited till her husband came home. Read the rest of the story. When the man came home, she told him what happened. He didn't believe her. How do you know he didn't believe her? The law was on his side and the law was clear. The punishment for that act was to be put to death. But you know, part of it had to do something. So instead of putting him to death, he put him in prison. He locked him up. He locked him up. So now Joseph is locked up again. But he's still didn't write himself out of the script. While in prison, he becomes the top man in prison. Work out. So you got to know how to live where you are. And the thing that you read is you don't read bitterness in Joseph. He just adjusted. Okay. All right. Okay, I'm in prison. Now, how, how, what do I do now? God, oh man, I'm locked up and I can't get out. I got to preach faster. I can't get out. And uh, what do I do now? I know I work my way up. And while in prison, God, the Lord, the Bible teaches that the Lord was, was with him. Chapter 39, verse 23 says, The keeper of the prison looked not to anything that, that was under his hand because the Lord was with him, and that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. Verse 22 says, And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph all committed to Joseph's hands all the prisoners that were in the prison and whatsoever they did there. And he was, and he was the doer of it. So the Lord gave him favor and the Lord calls him to prosper and the Lord was with him. You got to seek God with you where you are. Don't sit there and get mad at everybody else and, and, and get jealous and get filled with envy and get a case of why me, oh me, sad me, messed up me, they haven't done me right, poor me, everybody's out to get me. Ain't nobody thinking about you. You got to learn to see what God is doing and what the Lord is saying. The Lord gave Joseph favor while in prison. And then one day, 
While he was in there, two, two very famous men, infamous, were in there. The chief cupbearer, King James called him the butler, and the chief baker. Now, they did something, and they got on the wrong side of Pharaoh, and he threw them in prison. And uh, the chief baker and the chief butler had a dream. They dreamed. And Joseph interpreted both men's dreams. Uh, he said to the butler who was the cup bearer, who was the former head of security in Pharaoh's administration. He said to him, here's the meaning of your dream. Yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thine head and restore thee into, the, into thy place. And thou shalt deliver Pharaoh's cup into his hands after the former manner when thou was his butler. He says, but do, but, but, but listen. He says, in three days you're going to be restored. But here's what I'm, I want to ask you to do. When it comes to pass, but think on me when it shall be well with thee and show kindness. I pray thee, I pray thee unto me and make mention of me unto Pharaoh and bring me out of this house. Notice, he didn't like being in prison. He prospered in it, but it wasn't a cakewalk. And he wanted to get out because he had broken no crime. He, he committed no crime. His brothers did this to him. And he said, all I ask you to do, I'm not going to charge you for the interpretation. Just when you get out, remember me. Verse 15, this is Genesis chapter 40, verse 13 and 15 I just preached to you. Verse 15 tells us that he did not see the good in being in prison because he wanted to get out. But he still did not write himself out of the script. He also interpreted the baker's dream. He says, but in three days, so I got bad news for you. If you study Genesis 40 and 19, he said, in three days, you will be hung. So the three days passed. The baker was hung and the butler was free. It came to pass. Two years butler forgot Joseph. He didn't speak to Pharaoh. See, sometimes the Lord lets you go through for a while. Two more years passed. Genesis 41 and 1 says that it came to pass that at the end of two full years that Pharaoh had a dream. And when Pharaoh had the dream, he sent for his Egyptian astrologer. His, his, his holy men of Egypt. I feel something. And none of them could interpret the dream. Two years later, the cup bearer says, I remember. How could I have forgotten? There, there is a man uh, two years ago, uh, two years and three days ago, who interpreted my dream. And he told me that you would restore me. And three days later, you brought me out. And, uh, and, 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 and Pharaoh, he's a Hebrew. And his name is Joseph. Pharaoh said, what? Go get him. R remember, you know, the last time we heard about his clothes, they were left in the hands of Potiphar's wife. But let me tell you something. God knows how. God knows how to fix it. The Bible tells us that it came to pass, Genesis 41 and 13, it says it came to pass uh, as he says he's interpreted it for us. Verse 14 says, Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him hastily out of the dungeon, and look at this, and shaved himself, and look at this, and changed his raiment. And brought him before Pharaoh. They dressed him up. And brought him before the king. Good God Almighty. Oh my. Lord's working. 
and told the, and said to the king, uh, tell me your dream. The king gave Joseph his dream, and Joseph interpreted the dream. You can read the dream when you, when you get home. But the interpretation was, that was going to be seven years of plenty. But, 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 but there's coming seven years of famine. Yes, now, now, see, this was wonderful because if you have one year of plenty, then have two years of plenty, and, and, and three years of plenty, so forth and so on, it's easy to assume that this is the way it's going to be for the rest of your life. We're just going to have plenty. So it's like a lot of athletes, they spend the money as fast as they get it because they think that they're going to, they're going to always be on top. They think they will always, the, the entertainer, think he will always make another hit record. Don't save a dime. It will always be there. But in life, there are ebbs and flows. So no matter how well things are going today, that all, everybody have to deal with the vicissitudes of life. Attendance is up, attendance is down. Business is up, business is down. And you got to know in the time of plenty how to prepare for the times of famine. If you don't learn this lesson, you will, you will grow to be old and broke and have nothing and have to live off of, the, off of the, the pity and the goodwill of others because you did not understand how to save. <coughs> and how to carry yourself in the years of famine. Years of plenty. Are you with me? So he interprets the dream. I'm spending too much time before you today. Praise the Lord. This is my fourth time preaching this week and four different messages. Praise the Lord. And uh, he, he preached, he, he interpreted the dream, and Pharaoh took him, according to chapter uh, 41 and verse 39, uh, Pharaoh elevated him. Praise the Lord. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, For as much as God hath showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Verse 40 says, Thou shalt be over my house, and according to thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. I wonder what was Potiphar's wife saying <laughs> on the ascension day. When she's out there, we, her husband, is a chief officer, two or three rooms down the ladder in the section where maybe there are cheap seats. And the Hebrew is standing there, dressed up in royal clothes, being crowned. And there ain't a thing she can do about it. I can see her now with her <laughs> lips stuck out, mad, knowing that she missed the boat. And part of her, I knew, he, I knew he didn't. I can hear him now. I know he didn't mess with you no way. That's why I didn't kill him. Because you're a hoe. <laughs> oh, they had a bad day that day. They went home fighting. <laughs> oh, it wasn't good. It wasn't good. They went home fighting. You messed, you messed this thing up. Here's the man now. He's the most powerful man in all of Egypt. And when the famine hit way up there in Israel where Joseph's brothers live, where his daddy lived, where the men who, who praise the Lord, sold him live. They had to come down to Egypt because they had that in Egypt they were doing well and that there was plenty in Egypt. Now you see God's plan unfolding because the Lord had to get Joseph in the place 
to interpret the dream to save the Egyptians and to save the Hebrews, to save the family tree of uh, Jacob, to make sure that the family line and the people to whom Jesus Christ would be born through their family line, that they would continue and not be wiped out by the famine that would come in years later. The Lord allowed that boy to be sold and to go through what he went through and to be sold again and to go through all those things to bring about that good. Thank God that he never wrote himself out of the script. My God, you ought to lift your hands and tell the Lord, whatever my script is, I'll just stay in place. Because the Lord is using every one of you. Every one of us are put here for his purpose. I told you with God, there are no mistakes. I opened up with that. I told you, coach, there are no torn, thrown away papers. I told you, I told you that, uh, th that we're all here by divine providence and that is good. That is good that the Lord has for you and that is good that you are supposed to do. You just can't get out of the script. You got to let go and let go. Have his way. Uh, somebody throw your hands up and say, have your way, Lord. So... In our text, in our text, I'm going home now. I've worked hard this week. Pam got some special food for me. Uh -huh. See, shake your neighbor's hand and tell them you may not be able to see the good right now, but keep living. Mm. Oh, Lord. One more thing, and I won't bother you no more with your neighbor, but just tell your neighbor, let the Lord finish the book of the story of your life. Oh, Lord. Mm -hmm. If you read Judges chapter 10, you'll find that Israel once more and again backslid. It said, and the children of Israel in Judges 10 and 6, it says, and the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam and Ashtaroth and the gods of Syria. They served Balaam, Ashtaroth, the gods of Syria, the gods of Zidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the children of Ammon and the gods of the Philistines. And they forsook the Lord and served him not. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And he sold them into the hands of the Philistines. And into the hands of the children of Ammon. And that year they waxed, they vexed and oppressed the children of Israel. They oppressed them for 18 years. For 18 years and all the children of Israel all the children of Israel that were on the east side of Jordan in the land of the Amorites which is Gilead so on the east side where there's Gilead and the land of the Amorites the Amorites oppressed them there but moreover the children of Ammon they passed over the Jordan River and came over to the west side good God Almighty to fight against Judah and against Benjamin and against the house of Ephraim and so Israel was distressed because you see the battle that they kept over in Gilead on the west side had now crossed over deep into Israeli territory on the east side that's why you got to stop the devil while the stopping is good because if you let him stay in your little finger after a while he'll take up your hand and if you leave him in your right hand after a while he'll evade your left hand so the devil had come in and he had plowed all the way down into Ephraim and Israel was distressed and the children of Israel they cried to the Lord they repented and they forsook Balaam 
verse 11 says, you don't mind if the Bible preached today. Verse 11 says, and the Lord said unto the children of Israel, did not I deliver you from the Egyptians and from the Amorites and the children of Ammon and from the Philistines? I delivered you, uh, the, the Zidonians also. Verse 12, and from the Amalekites and the Ammonites and, and did oppress you and you cried to me and I delivered you out of their hand. Yet you have forsaken me and served other gods. Wherefore shall I deliver you anymore? Go cry to those gods which you left me for. Call on them in your day of tribulation. God had had enough and the children of Israel said to the Lord, we have sinned. Do thou to us whatever seemeth good unto thee. Deliver us only. We pray thee this day. They said, do what you want, but please don't leave us in the hands of these Ammonites. Oh, Lord. And they put away their strange gods from among them and served the Lord. And, the, and his soul was grieved for the misery of Israel when they put away their strange gods. Isn't it good to know that we serve a God who is rich in mercy? He felt bad for them. Hallelujah. And the children of Ammon with their bad selves were now gathered and encamped in Gilead. And the children of Israel assembled themselves together and encamped in Misphi. Now you need to see it now. There are two war camps. The battle is about to take place. There is Ammon in their battle camp, having already marched over and conquered. And they're in a winning mood. The people of Gilead is in Misphi and they're afraid and the people and the princes of gilead said one to another what man what man is he who will begin to fight against the children of ammon they said which one of you will lead us into battle will you lead us the man said no i'm not gonna do it they asked another leader will you lead us he said you must think i'm crazy i'm not gonna do it they couldn't find anybody who was man enough to take a stand we're living in a day where manhood is in short supply so many of us now are scared to take a stand there's so many preachers they preach good sermons talking about nothing they won't preach about anything that is controversial you're just like these men of Gideon these Gileadites you're in the war camp but you won't fight you have on a uniform but you won't fight they couldn't find anybody who would fight they couldn't find a man who is in on the ready I wonder if we have some ready men in this place some men who are ready to stand up and be a man to lead your family to take care of your children to be in place in church to call on the name of the Lord to be men of God indeed I know it's out of style but if it don't ever ever if it never come back in style my hips are gonna stay straight my wrist is gonna stay straight I'm not going sissy I'm not going punk I'm not going weak people are always criticizing men for being masculine but I don't apologize for being a man yes I'm strong yes I'm confident yes I'm able good God almighty because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world and the Lord delivered me from the spirit of cowardice and gave, has given me the spirit of love and of power and of a sound mind. 
I wonder could I have some sound mind men to praise the Lord I wonder could I hear some sound mind women praise the Lord I wonder could I hear some sound mind saints some saints who are not afraid praise the Lord yeah yeah Lord oh Jesus Lord wait a minute so they couldn't find anybody they couldn't find anybody so the author in his genius way of writing he goes back in time he said now that was now Jephthah the Gileadite he was a mighty man of valor he could fight he was from a strong family but he had a problem he was illegitimate his mama was a hollered he hallelujah he was an illegitimate young man and his daddy married another woman and she had children for him she had sons but the daddy died and then the sons good god almighty they got together and they said to him you you're not our brother you're not our brother good god almighty you're not going to get the inheritance and they kicked him out good god almighty but i thank god you can kick me out you can kick me around you can dismiss me but if god doesn't good god almighty it won't matter aren't you glad that you have god's favor in your life aren't you glad oh glad that the lord had kicked you to the curb you ought to tell your neighbor i said i wasn't gonna say that no more but neighbor you can kick me to the curb but the lord hadn't kicked me to the curb yeah yes yeah yes oh yeah oh yeah he went to the land of tob when he got to tob wasn't nobody there but tough guys like this group right here tough guys hallelujah and life began to beat him up life got hard on him he joined the gang he became a marauder but the lord was watching over him hallelujah he learned to steal and he learned to kill he learned to fight hallelujah and then the story comes back real time see sometimes in real time you can't see what god is doing in real time see why you're living it you can't see it sometimes you got to live it and then look back on it now i see what the lord was doing but i couldn't see it then because i was too busy living it in real time praise the lord for your real time Verse 4 brings us back to where the story ended in chapter 10 and verse 18. They're still in the walking. They're still poised. The men of Gilead are still arguing. Won't nobody step up. So the elders say, let's go. Let's go to Todd. Tob. We got to go 15 miles. And they find him. There he is. Looking like a Greek god. Probably just finished fighting somebody. Just got back. Off of a raid. Wasn't polished. But they didn't need polish. They needed a man. They needed a warrior. I 
I'll trade manhood for being polished any day. I'd rather have both, but if I got to choose, good God Almighty. So they walk up to him, and when he, when, when he looks at him, he knows what y'all want. We want you to come with us. We want you to come with us. We need you to come with us. We need you to come with us. We need you to come and fight. For Jeff, I look. You must be talking to the guy behind me. Because I know you haven't come for me. Me. Because you put me out. I'm a bastard. You, you dismissed me. You told me that I wasn't good enough. You threw me out. I know you're not coming to me. No, wait, look. Uh, we, uh, we're sorry, but look. Man. We need you. Oh, there, it, was, it was a pathetic sight. But, see, let me tell you, this is why you ought to treat people right. You never know who you got to come to. See, the Lord, listen, God knows how to get you off that horse. And, it, and, it, and let me tell you something. Oh, it's bitter. It's bitter getting off that thing. It's bitter having to come down. No pie tastes as worse as humble pie. Got to come all the way down. I, I dismissed you. I dismissed you. I treated you like you're nothing. Now I got to come to you. My God, my God. Here I am, brother. Be careful. Be careful. Be careful. Because that person that you're mistreating, God has a script. God has a script. Oh, he ain't nobody. He's homeless. God has a script. God has a script. That can't be him. No, it looks like him. No, it's not him. Yeah, it's me. I'm the man who was beside the beautiful gate. It's me, it's me walking and leaping and praising God. And some of you, you just walked past me when I was by, by the gate. I was a nobody. But now, I'm the star of the show. God has a script. So, I've preached enough. I'm tired. So, they said, be our leader. He said, I'll do it. But you got to make me in charge. Well, we'll elevate yourself. No, no, no. Uh. I got to be number one. I'll do it if I'm the head honcho. And I want it in writing. And I want it said in your war camp, in Misfit, where the soldiers are, where everybody will hear it. Because you know what? I'm, I'm going to win this fight. See, because I've been trained and told, I'm, fighting is what I do. I know how to fight. See, I'll win it for you. But you're going to have to pay me. And the rest is history. I want to say to you today, the Lord told me to tell you. The Lord told me to tell you. Do not throw the paper in the trash. Do not assume that the Lord is through with you. Hallelujah. Do not give up on God. And do not give up on yourself. Let the writer 
finish writing. Hallelujah. Let the Lord, let the Lord finish the book. Glory to God. You never know in God what's behind curtain number one. Curtain number two, curtain number three. You never know in God what's just over the next horizon. All of us have been at injunctures in our lives where we were at our wits end. Thinking that it was over. Only to live on and see the Lord work it out. I want to pray for somebody whom this word has spoken to. Preacher, that word was for me. Whether it's Jephthah or Joseph, it was for me. Come to the altar. Bible teaches Psalms 107. In verse 27, said they reel to and fro and stagger like drunken men and are at their wits end. They're in a place where they don't know what to do. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble and he bringeth them out of all their distresses. I've been at my wit's end and the Lord brought me out. He brought me out. He's brought me out. He'll bring you out. He'll make a way. Yes, he will. He's God. He opened doors that you cannot see. Amen. He moves in ways that we do not know. All you have to do is trust him. And where you are, I said to the elders in the back today, I said, master serving the Lord and appreciating the Lord where you are. All right. All right. Most of us fail to learn the lessons of where we are for looking to where we think we should be. It is the nature of fallen man to always assume he's uh, are you all what, what, are you, what are you doing? Okay. okay you call a little disturbance here. Uh, uh, just assume see himself in many cases before ahead of what God wants him to be. I'm trying to say. The Levites got upset with Moses because they were not priests. They could not enjoy the privilege of being Levites because they weren't priests. They couldn't learn the lessons of being a Levite because they weren't priests. I'll never forget one time, a few years ago, a, a bishop came up to me and told me, he says, man, you just keep serving in your church, this church, your day will come. He was talking about being a bishop. <clears throat> Thought to myself, I didn't say it to him because I wouldn't dare disrespect him. Bishop, my day has arrived. I'm enjoying Jesus where I am. I'm happy in Jesus. I'm walking in the will of the Lord. I'm where the Lord wants me. So I'm not serving him about something that will come. I'm serving him. I love him for when it's, what has come to pass. When the last time you've given God a, it has come to pass, praise. <clears throat> you didn't always live where you live now. You couldn't always dress like you can now. Things haven't always been as good as they are now. When they weren't, when they weren't then, you, you want it now. Amen. Now you treat now like it's nothing. But I've seen a time when if you could get to just where you are now, now, you'd be so thankful. I'm not giving up. He's not through writing. Thank you, thank you. I'm going thank you. all the way. 
Lift your hands. Glory. 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 Father. Father, Father. We come before you right now. Right now, Lord. We come as, as Joseph's. We come as Jephthah's. We come as people who've been dismissed in some cases, sold out in other cases, framed in others. Think about all the things. Hallelujah. But Lord, we also come declaring that we won't give up, won't quit. We're not going to be written out. <laughs> We won't write ourselves out of the script that you have for us. But we come before you right now saying, Lord, have your way. In the name of Jesus, have your way in my life. Have your way in my heart. Have your way in my mind. Oh, God, I, I, I receive what's going on right now as you train me. Notice when the Lord trains you. Notice in every case, they, they found Joseph. They went and found Jephthah. He didn't go looking. They went and found him. When the Lord gets ready for you, he'll find you and bring you out. And praise the Lord. You just, you, just get, you just stay right where you are and let the Lord train you. Train me, Lord. Make me, Lord. In the name of Jesus. Woo! Somebody said, I've been trained already. No, no, no. When, you, when the training is over, he'll, he'll take you to the next place. Ask the Lord, train me. Make me Jesus. Make me the person you'd have me to be. Make me the saint that you would have me to be. Oh, God. Thank you, Jesus. I'll stay in your oven. I'll stay on the stove. I'll stay in the script. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, God. Make me and mold me. Strengthen me in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. That I might do your will and be all you'd have me to be. In the name of Jesus. So I put my life in your hands. I put my story in your hands. I put my health in your hands. I put my welfare in your hands. I put my future in your hands. I put my upward mobility in your hands. Jesus, Jesus, strengthen me right now. Strengthen me right now. Do it in my heart. Do it in my soul. Do it in my mind. I'll go where you lead me. I'll follow where you lead. I say yes to you. Yes to your will. Yes to your way. And yes to your word. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Receive him right now. Receive your blessing. Receive. Receive from the writer. Receive from the writer. You just read your script and just follow your script. Study the Bible. Stay on your knees. Learn the lessons. Every round goes higher and higher. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. He'll strengthen your heart. Wait on the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Sometimes life gets bitter. Sometimes it gets hard. Sometimes it gets rough. But Jesus is with you. The devil is a liar. You're not alone. You may feel alone, but you're not alone. Your emotions may tell you that you're alone, but you're not alone. For Jesus said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Somebody said, well, preacher, 
Sometimes I need Jesus to send me some human companionship, somebody to talk to. Well, don't you know that when it's time for that person to appear, Jesus will send that person. But until then, the Lord has you in a place where it's just you and Jesus, and Jesus and you, and you and Jesus, and Jesus and you, and you ought to thank him, praise him, magnify him. Oh! Woo.